Hello, uh, thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, my name is Julieta Aranda. I am the organizer of the conversations program at Art Basel since this year. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's almost over. And it's a great, great pleasure in this case to uh, introduce a panel where we are, it's the Creative Cities Talk Art Scene on the Rise. And it's uh, with the que uh, pondering the question, will Athens become the new art capital of Europe? And to discuss this, uh, after having been in Athens many times, it's uh, really nice to be able to bring some of the people that have made the city into what it is to try to hash the topic. Um, after all the events of the past decade, from the financial crisis to to the increase of refugees seeking shelter in Europe, and even the 14th edition of Documenta. What is happening in Athens? Many artists have moved to the Greek capital, attracted by the affordability and the good weather. But the skeptics keep saying that the city's resurgence is a bubble and will be short-lived. In this panel, we will discuss the cultural developments in Athens with some key members of its vibrant art scene. The moderator of the panel is Stephanie Hessler, uh, a curator and writer based in London and Stockholm. She curated the recent edition of the Athens Biennial, so she's intimately familiar with the scene, even though she is not Greek. We have Angelo Plessas, who is an artist based in Athens, and he uh, recently opened a space called Pet Projects. We have Marina Fokidis, curator and writer. Uh, she's the director uh, and the mind behind of the magazine uh, South as a State of Mind. She was involved in the last documenta, and she also ran the legendary Kunsthalle Athena, uh, lovely place. And we have finally George Van Vakidis, the co-founder of Breeder Gallery, Athens. So um, please welcome them, and let's get going with the talk. Thank you, Julieta, for the introduction and for inviting us here and to Art Basel and, of course, to uh, my fellow panelists. Um, as Julieta said, uh, I was living in Athens for half a year uh, last year on the occasion of being one of three curators of the Athens Biennale. And um, I moved there very excited about coming to a place of which I had heard a lot and, you know, uh, which was supposed to be one of the new centers of art in Europe. And, uh, of course, there's been a lot of buzz about other cities as well, such as Lisbon or uh, Brussels for a while, and there's always um, the question, you know, which will be the, the next sort of um, art capital. We had a conversation about this previously, also um, considering this idea of capital and what that could mean. Um, and to start the conversation, I wanted to ask the three of you who've been so active in Athens for a very long time, how you've perceived the change of the scene, in particular, say, during the past 10 to 15 years. So after the financial crisis and also after the Comenta in 2007. Um, Marina, perhaps you want to start. As I'm the oldest. <laughs> so thank you very much, Julieta, for having me here and Art Basel, and thank you for the question. Um, yes, it's been 10 or 15 years of Bambi Roads and lots of adventures and altered states of minds. Um, and also, you know, uh, I have to say that asking what is an art center or an art capital or not uh, in Europe, first we have to complexify the notions of Europe in itself and the notion of uh, capital, even a city. So let's say that a city, a polis in the platonic sense, is a conglomerate of people. So we are talking about people with humors, bodies, capitals like heads, hands, genitalias, uh, flaws, scars, traumas, and happiness as well, and joy. So um, I think that saying that something is an art center or not, it's almost like a quote I was telling you earlier this morning by Anne Carson in her book Eros. It's a kind of when you run breathlessly to do something but had not arrived yet, there is a sp suspended moment of living in hope. So, in one hand or another, I'm very glad we have not arrived 
despite all our efforts the last 10 years. What has happened with the crisis is that because it was a rupture, it was very sad in the way it was demonstrated uh, in Greece, almost like the talking head song, uh, this is not your beautiful house, you wake up one day, this is not your beautiful car, this is not, because we were running on a, on a corrupted economy, and then we had to change our habits. Uh, I think that as so many people lost their jobs, their security, their center, cent certainties, it was a very big collaboration between people, individuals, collectives, artists, on finding ways to sustain what we thought there was there, if we call it an art scene. So we had a lot of in individual, um, uh, let's say independent um, um, centers that started from individual will, like, uh, or centers or institutions like the Athens Biennial, like the Kunsthalle Athena, where the currency of exchange there was not monetary, but um, let's say it was what I call a currency of love which doesn't mean prostitution necessarily, it also in some cases, but it means mostly exchanging with love. In our case, we opened the Kunsthalle Athena in 2010, and for example, we were based on this kind of love between people, on inviting artists and, or going in, that they knew that they're coming somewhere that there was no way to be funded by anywhere. And we worked for free, but we don't feel it that way because the currency is not only the money. So in that way, I would also challenge the question of the panel and then I can, which is, I know it came in a challenging way and I would say maybe Athens is one of the uncapitals of the arts in Europe, which is also an interesting proposition to discuss further. George, um, your gallery was founded in 2002, and then you moved to a new space in 2008. So you've been busy or active uh, way before the crisis, and maybe you can tell us a bit about your um, you know, position as a gallerist in the city. Right, okay, so being the gallerist, um, let me first, how do we define an art capital? So most of the times, we define it in economic terms. Yeah, can you? Um, but an art capital, per se, is not only the place where transactions are being made, like New York, London, Hong Kong. Louder? Okay. So capital can take many forms. It can take, uh, like, uh, the form of freedom of speech. This is a capital. Uh, democracy is a great capital. Um, so those are qualities that also, in my opinion, would consist of a place that we can call an art capital, uh, especially nowadays with um, censorship penetrating our everyday life. Um, and we see that every day in the news, what is happening. Um, I would say that we need physical places that serve as free zones for creativity, free zones for freedom of speech. And Athens traditionally was, and I think still is, uh, one of those places. Now, over the past 10 years, uh, Athens became also the capital of crisis in Europe, another capital. Um, so basically, a lot of disaster happened uh, in the local art scene, like collectors disappeared, the artists lost their income, public funding ceased to exist. Um, so we tried to find alternative ways of operating. So ba basically breaking away from the traditional uh, gallery model. For example, we did a residency inside the gallery uh, where artists were invited to come, live and work inside the space. So they were exposed directly to the workings of the gallery, being totally integrated into the local art scene. Uh, we created, for example, a vegan restaurant inside an art installation, Andreas Angelidakis's uh, work. So those alternative models helped us navigate through the crisis, but also made us sort of balance out the economic aspect of the business with the pleasure of actually doing creative things. 
And uh, Angelo, you're um, an artist and now also run a project space. Uh, can you say, well, what was it like for you to actually live and work in Athens, uh, be based there, but also work uh, internationally in the past 10 years? Has it changed? And how do you see uh, you know, the influx of um, people coming to the city, you know, creative workers, artists, curators, etc., in recent years? I, I totally agree with what George and Marina said, and the city has changed really drastically, also in bad ways, but in the good ways. For example, I will speak about the positive ways. I think the art scene had become uh, less uh, hierarchical. It's more penetrative. It's been become more creative. And even that you don't have money from the state, uh, you know, you have like the Greek oligarchs still that they, the only ones that could buy art, they feel like they are in Manhattan. And there is, there is a lot of like, you know, plurality in the art world and there in the, in Athens. So, um, but um, that creates also some uh, mixed feelings because we are now in a transitional moment and I will speak a little bit about the present situation. Uh, Athens is a bit like a twilight zone. You have this great infrastructure that has been also created by Documenta 14. But also personally, I will say that um, you have all these great people moving there, buying apartments, creative people, artists, young people. You see so many people in exhibitions, in openings. It's much better to have this people than, uh, you know, having some Chinese speculators buying an apartment and putting up the prices of, uh, which also happens. So, yeah, Athens is, is changing very slowly. Uh, but also I have also this other mixed feeling because we artists, we are a bit like uh, complex creatures and we struggle between desires. At some point I feel, okay, the city, I'm scared that it might lose a little bit its, uh, you know, flair. It might be nice to stay a bit like a peripheric city and uh, keeps its, uh, you know, rigidity because it's not a glamorous city. It's a very, very tough uh, place also, and uh, you know, it's a very strange moment. It's a good moment. It's a city that it's been redefined all the time, and I see that before even the crisis. It was a city very much in flux. And, uh, and personally speaking, even financially for me, it was even a better time, the times of the crisis, than before. When I uh, lived there, I was living on the edge of Petraluna and Kukaki, which is one of the areas, um, I think they call it uh, Airbnb Kukaki or Kukaki Airbnb. Yes. Yeah, so um, it is very, very obvious what is happening there. What do you think, you know, th what the role of the arts is or can be with this kind of change? Because from what you're saying, on the one hand, it is very positive that people come to the city and there's an influx of new ideas and spaces opening. Um, but on the other hand, of course, you know, uh, in order to avoid the next, being the next Berlin in the way of the Airbnb crisis and how, you know, apartments and rents are going up in Berlin, what do you think um, the role of the arts can possibly be? Um, what I want to say is that what Athens offers is inspiration. So if you're an artist or if you're a creative person, it's impossible not to be inspired coming into the city. Now, what Athens has is what I would call soft infrastructure. So basically, there is no really operating museum or institutions for contemporary art, but it's on the ground, the people, the energy, and the relationships and the exchange of ideas that's very vivid. So when you come in, you get absorbed into that sort of uh, tunnel that really makes you, inspires you, and you know, sort of makes you want to live there. Uh, and I believe a lot in the value of the soft infrastructure compared to the, to the institutional sort of infrastructure of other cities. I, I totally agree with this point. Um, and coming back to your question of Kukaki, I, this area, I happen to live there. So how do we combine the soft infrastructure with uh, the problem of um, 
you know, the privatization of the space. And um, because Athens is based, and Greece in general, is based to soft infrastructure, one of the infrastructures was also how the society is growing. So in the absence of any kind of um, strong welfare system, we had this kind of very, fam people from the global south or the broader south would know that, very close familia, uh, family tights or friend tights, and people help each other when they get older or sick or, so Airbnb comes and destroys neighborhoods. Any Airbnb, any kind of monster like the Airbnb. To be honest with you, my fear is not if Athens will become Berlin, because Berlin in, in itself, it's a very interesting city, extremely inspiring for people because there is the old Berlin, the east, it's how you see Berlin. Not even Cairo, I mean, we had uh, recently a mayor that was saying, oh, Athens, like he was running on the election, failed to be the new Berlin, uh, and it's unfortunately the new Cairo. And that's also like why Athens has to be one or the other and not in itself a city, you know? Uh, so I think it's kind of interesting how we see things and how we name things. I think it's a city which is in this kind of flaw or crack between the Aristotelian actuality and potentiality. Not the one, like how it is now, that you were saying a harsh reality, and it is for many of us, and not arrived yet. And I think there is the soft structure that you're saying where artists can get really inspired and learn from. When we started the documenta, uh, and actually when Adam Simchik had this wonderful idea and courageous idea, I mean, he's, you know, we are paying our debts for this, to mirror two cities symbolically that had nothing to do with one each other and share an exhibition between these two cities. So create a kind of a precarious mirroring was exactly opening up the space to be this third space between the potentiality, the actuality, the harsh actuality, and the potentiality. So somehow creating, um, like elongating this suspended moment that I think this is what's happening now. So if there is one way that the art scenes, let's put it that way, the international art scenes, the people that they're moving into Greece, and that's what makes an art capital, can help is by <coughs> joining our society or creating a society of lovers, listeners, um, learner, uh, like students, and all together start redefining the world once again from the beginning or from one beginning. I think this is the difference. Like, I'm happy if Athens or any Athens as such is a capital because that means that we're gonna see the world upside down um, you know, left uh, or right, and we are not going to be under this misappropriation that Athens is the cradle of Western civilization, because that was a kind of uh, misappropriation that has to be restituted. Uh, I want to add that uh, Athens is also a very physical city. It's a city that there is another um, concept of time and space. We have big spaces there, the time is different, you know, you take your time to do things. And this is very, very good for artists. I'm always speaking from the viewpoint of artists. And it's really important to speak about the emotional capital of uh, creative people. It's really important to have a quality of life and, you know, make things without, you know, have the stress. And I want to say that, for example, the big metropolis that now the art production is happening, I see like New York, for example, which I used to live years ago, it's becoming a bit like a virtual city because I have my friends who live there. They sometimes, they don't have time to go out. They don't have time because they work too much or they have to do other professions or it's too expensive to do these things. So they are very much attached to their um, social web of their city just through Instagram or social media and they just don't go out. Athens is very the opposite of this. In a good, in a bad way, we are, you know, you go there, you meet people, you just, you know, either you like it or you're bored. It's a city that it's very, very physical. Um, I certainly had <laughs> some of those experiences myself. Um, you spoke about uh, sort of the soft infrastructures, and I want to talk a bit more about that. Uh, when we were installing the Athens Biennale last year, 
Um, we only were given access to the four buildings downtown 10 days before the opening. So, um, you know, we had to make them... They were abandoned buildings, a former hotel, and, um, and you know, a sort of administration building of the telecommunications company uh, and two other buildings. So uh, we had to make them fire safe and we had to make sure that, you know, they're clean-ish and so that to install the works. And it was an ex incredibly intense uh, moment, of course, to get all of this done. But it also, um, you know, it was possible because everybody was working incredibly hard and have, you know, people have an own, a very different way from what I have experienced in other places of uh, working. However, I feel that a challenge with these kinds of situations is that it's wonderful that it is, you know, that things can happen in a flexible way, in a different way that is not institutionalized. However, on the other hand, I feel especially, um, you know, in these kinds of precarious situations, it is also a problem if there is no uh, infrastructure, if this is sort of the modus operandi that continues over and over, and it doesn't change because it somehow works. So I'm wondering if you could say something about institutions, and I'm also aiming a bit towards maybe EMST. I don't know if you want to speak about this now or later, but um, the museum that's been closed, uh, opened, closed, opened, closed. So um, I can. maybe Marina can start. Actually, I want to somehow uh, make a little bit, perplex a little bit this issue of uh, institution and how institutions work. We know, I know exactly what you mean about having spaces that they were not there just four or five days before and having teams that they reunite, workers, and to open an exhibition on the right time, giving their soul and body to the fight, you know? And uh, that's very different, having also worked uh, so actively with my team, with our team in uh, installing Documenta in Castle in Athens. This was another kind of mirroring that Adam very wisely so put together uh, because it's a totally different way of working. But, I, and I understand your frustration, but we are used to this. No, no, I mean, to any, anyone's frustration, like the agony, the stress of such a thing. But that's a way of doing things as well. So one should think why one should be the institutional way and the other not, and no vice versa. You know what I mean? Because maybe that's like fighting with this kind of, because of course it has to do with the lack of money. There is no time when there is no money, you know, like you cannot pay. But instead of like being miserious under the lack of money, you create another form of institutionalizing processes and then that becomes your values and your also um, specialties. You know, when we opened the South as a State of Mind magazine, this is exactly where we were alluding. What if the world were formatted in others than Western, Northern, Western Protestant values and ways? And it was a kind of a different. Going into EMST, which is the National Museum uh, of Contemporary Art in Athens, and this is a big, uh, scar and flaw and gap, let's say. It's another story, of course. I was never involved as a director and I cannot even imagine the difficulties of directing an institution as such. Um, but uh, we have to understand that it's an institution that was initiated 21 years ago and never really opened, I mean, it opened in the very beginning in very many temporary um, places, but never really opened as a proper museum apart, uh, only during the documenta through the money, of course, of the entity of uh, the German institution. And it's a big discussion, and it was a very big miss not to have a state institution, however, as George was saying before, the, the galleries, the artist-run spaces, the artists themselves, and different houses took care of this. And somehow, the Kunsthal Athena, Athens Biennial, somehow this museum is right now spread in different neighborhoods and apartments. As you know, um, it's a the kind of tradition in Greece, just to end up with this, Kukaki is under the hill of the muses. And this hill was called the museum. The museum was where the muses lived. And whoever wanted to have inspiration, it was in the open, you know? Whoever wanted to have inspiration, they would go there, have a sleep or a nap or a drink in the park, and then get back home with what the muses would give them. So there is a way of having a museum without walls. Oh. <laughs> 
by the way, can I speak about the condition? Yeah, you can speak yeah. about the yeah, it's like uh, by in regards to the museum, and there was like a big uh, of a chaotic situation recently about uh, people. They started thinking that it should be great to have more transparent ways to find a director for this museum, and finally opens. Uh, the, the, the current ministry made an open call. They started like collecting proposals for, from uh, Greek and both international curators, and there was a, they didn't choose anyone finally. And uh, we started the petition, myself and two more people, uh, Marina and Georgia Sagri, and we collected a lot of um, uh, um, signatures from all over the world uh, for this, you know, fiasco of uh, not opening a museum. For us artists in Greece with so much going on, not having a museum uh, open, which is still operates, there is there the museum, the building, we pay the taxpayers paying you know, the functional cost of the museum without, you know, having a director is really, really a problem. So there was a great uh, response from all over the world uh, about this situation, and uh, it's still kind of unresolved. Um, if I may say, I'm more interested in creative capital. So what Angelos is doing, what the artists are doing, this is a form of capital that's there. So for us to take that capital and translate it, take it abroad, like see it as a currency and export it and add value to it, you know, this is also something that's very important. A museum is very important in that way too. It doesn't exist now. But being able to translate that creative currency that's there in Athens right now and uh, make it valuable, make it visible, is also an important task that everybody should uh, work towards. I mean, the question of capital to me is also, you know, one also needs to ask, okay, who is it for? And, you know, how do, like, what does it actually mean to, you know, export a cultural good uh, from a country? And I feel that that is a very important issue, especially for, uh, you know, places that are perhaps not the center, but consider the periphery or the global south, etc., where a certain exoticism and uh, possibly, you know, yeah, like people try to profit from, uh, you know, that which is other or that sort of capital. So I'm wondering also how the scene deals with that, because there is, of course, is, there are many dangers involved, one of them being that, uh, you know, exactly what you were referring to, which is a certain freedom or possibility to work, because the prices are not as expensive, because you do not necessarily have to participate in the system <laughs> as much as you do in other places. If that is lost, what happens? I have to say, um, I'm going back now to the export import. And uh, we, of course, smaller countries have a inherent uh, inferiority complex because we are smaller country, you know? And so the added value comes from the outside towards this. I think this is the first thing we have to change. Right? We are the center of the world. And from this point, the small point, we see the rest of the world. This doesn't mean that we are the center of the world for everybody. So there are many centers in this world. But we have to definitely, for all of us, I think, in this room, um, not only for Athens, but now we are discussing this, understand that everything is a matter of perspective. In the end of the day, we're fighting for space, but we all end six feet under in a very confined space which is great as well, but it's the same amount of space. And, you know, that's it. Now, I think if we understand the perspective and the center, the relationship between center and what's called periphery, which in Greek means surrounding, um, which is also a beautiful hug, you know, by as a sense of perspective, then we stop having us and them added values from the outside towards the inside. Of course, I speak not for money. But for love. <laughs> artistic is, value too. It's yeah. global. It doesn't yeah, have to exactly. be. Exactly. And I have to say that in terms of exotization or not, it's very interesting, but the, the term south were attached to Greece 
only when the crisis, economical crisis, started. It's very, very interesting. Before that, Europe was divided mostly west, east, like we knew we were in the eastern part of Europe. So as, as soon as the crisis started, then we are, the South Europe is united under a term, legitimate term, used by Financial Times, economists, and even in the European Parliament, that was called PIGS. I don't know if you remember. Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Imagine how you feel if you make part of the PIGS. <laughs> you know? But it's fine also. But I'm just saying how you legitimize terms. And then we understood that South was used not in geographical terms back then, South Europe, but as a derogatory, you know, like they are the ones that they spend the money. That they... So they've been so exoticized already. I don't think that there is a fear on creating um, a cultural identity that is different than others of exotization, because actually I think it's a process of restoring. We keep keep referring as in, in Greece as the Western, as we say, the cradle of Western civilization to its pure white marbles, when we all know that Parthenon was gold, fuchsia, yellow, green, and the, the white sculptures were having lipsticks, you know, and all the other colors. So it's more of a kind of restoration to understand what is, and not exotization. I would uh, put it on that ways. Can I add also something? Now the idea of, uh, I mean, for example, 50, 60 years ago, artists were moving in very, very big metropolis, for example, New York, uh, to grasp, you know, an opportunity for their career or more emotionally they were feeling they should move in a big city because there was more confident, they, feel, they felt more confident because they were closer where things happening. And that was making them more confident. Now we live like in a particular time uh, that, uh, you know, the system of coordinates, we live, it's very, very different from what it was. Uh, because of, you know, cheap traveling, uh, because of the internet. I feel everybody, like especially artists, they feel a little bit they are in the epicenter, which is, a, you know, a good and a bad thing. I'm not going to discuss this now, but the concept of, you know, living in a specific place now is a little bit obsolete. And, uh, you know, it's much easier to live everywhere now and, you know, moving around. And we have people like this in Athens who are very much experimental on their way. They perceive their surroundings. I don't know how long they will be in Athens, but it's kind of, you know, a, a road to somewhere. There's a interesting distinction that we make between, uh, you know, cultural workers who are in a position to be able to travel and, you know, go to Athens for some years and then go back to Berlin or London or wherever. Um, and of course, the refugees. So I would really, you know, argue with or, you know, yeah, argue with that idea of it is easier to be, you know, displaced and to move because I think there, of course, there's a choice, and as soon as long as you have that choice, of course, it can be wonderful and fantastic. But if you do not, then uh, possibly the you know safety of having one place to live is exactly what you long for. Um, but of course, that is also it's an interesting tension. Know that this all coexists within the same city, and um, I felt a certain anachronism, especially because of that, very often in the city where you feel that. Uh, through the financial crisis there, you know, of course, it's really, you know, upset most of the country. Uh, and some people seem to have moved on. And it seems to, you know, there's so many project spaces, which is fantastic. Also, I don't know, new cafes, shops and whatnot. But there also seems to be that other part of the city which somehow stayed behind. And I think that especially considering the awful political climate in Europe and elsewhere at the moment, also among others in Greece, of course, that this sort of rift is a huge uh, problem. But immigrants are part of the fabric of the society in Athens, and artists are responding to it. Um, and it's very important what you said, because I think what makes Athens, or what could potentially make Athens a capital is it's placed as a free zone, a free zone where people can operate, exchange ideas, and sort of uh, be tolerant towards each other. 
and create a community that's um, very open. Uh, and I think that those are qualities that the city has to offer, again, coming to the, to the soft infrastructure. Maybe a free sentimental zone, I guess you mean, because, of course, there is a small space, uh, very condensed, as you say, with uh, a lot of um, uh, immigrants and refugees that they keep coming as it's the door to Europe and people. But what unites, uh, like people that they were living here and the expats and the new artists and, you know, whatever. But I think what unites all these entities, because communities is something that the capitals are putting on our heads, let's say these emotional entities, I think is the kind of different sense of understanding the world. I would insist on that. Because Greeks are very are immigrants themselves uh, in their genes, like over two thirds of Greece came from the Asia Minor. So already there is this kind of different understanding. Now, what you were saying about independent spaces in uh, cafes and then another part staying behind, yes, the crisis is exhausting and in economical terms is still there. Imagine a crisis which is supposed to be a moment for over 10 years. You know, it's a normality now, a precarious normality. And uh, it's extremely difficult to, uh, um, you know, go with it in your everyday light, life. However, when you start, if you're, I was reading a beautiful quote that says that if you're a swimmer, when you jump in the sea, um, in the first, let's say, part of crossing a very difficult path, speaking of immigrants as well, you always refer to where you left from. So you go back and you see the ground and you say, okay, I left from there. In the last part, you always refer to the place you arrived. You're like, you say a few more strokes and I'm there, ground. But there is a middle part where you see not from where you left and not where you're going. If you manage to balance on that middle part of black waters, this is a Michel Serre idea, then probably new maps, new cosmographies, new realities, new ways of seeing the world will open up to you. And I don't say this in a romantic way. I really say that because it's, as you say, we are becoming a, touristical, a touristic heaven in the service of, because that's the main problem. I mean, from one hand, our economy is dependent to, I mean, we have 40% up tourism than when we ever had. We're going to have like over 2 million people arriving this summer in Greece. And we are becoming a touristic heaven. But on the other hand, there is an everyday life that strives to survive. And to that, I have to say, is what I think was uh, the challenge that made the art scene, let's put it on uh, quote marks, come to Athens. Because it's a different way of fighting to keep this open space open than to just go in a place and be a kind of a nice crew in a system already formed. The system is being formed as we speak there. And it's a chance to all of us to form the system the way we want it, all together as a collectivity, an interlocal collectivity. Because I have to say, locality, I mean, I heard before that uh, where one lives right now, it's obsolete. And I don't agree so much with this. I think locality I matters in the wake of environmental crisis more than anything. We have to stop using the planes. No, so no, much. I meant that, like, uh, you know, cultural product points now are more decentralized than it used to be before. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, George, you were involved in bringing Condo Unit to uh, your gallery. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, how did that idea start? And will you continue? What was sort of the legacy of that? Uh, it was last October. End of last yes. So Kondo is a great, great concept that was initiated by Vanessa Carlos. Um, and basically what happens, it's an alternative model to the art fair. Um, so basically in a city, the galleries collaborate and they invite, they invite colleagues from other countries to come use the gallery space and host exhibitions. So it's like an exchange of exhibitions between galleries uh, or co-hosting. Uh, shows. It's great because it gives you the opportunity to bond and to make friendships with colleagues. Art fairs are very competitive. So in an art fair, the gallerists very rarely speak to each other, you know, because they have their booths and they have to sell and they're very competitive, which is great. But Kondo has a more sort of um, open 
view and more like a more sentimental approach to it. So you, you're coming closer with the artists, you're coming closer with your colleagues. Um, yes, it's something that we will continue to do in Athens. I think it was a great success. Everybody had fun. Uh, there were sales. So all the components are there for it to continue to happen. Uh, it coincided with the opening of our Biennale, so it was a wonderful moment. In the yes, city. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Marina, you've been so active also in writing and through South, the magazine, in bringing art writing from Greece to an international audience. So I was wondering if you could say something about, you know, what did South actually change? What's the state of art writing in Athens? And, um, you know, what kind of difference can a magazine like South make? Well, the magazine is called South is a State of Mind, and it's not a correction. It's just, of course, everybody for the calls it South, but it means something, the South is a State of Mind. We thought in the absolutely moment of dispossession, uh, Greek dispossession in 2012, that we are possessed with a spirit of authority and with many spirits, and uh, that we will somehow um, oppo impose to the rest of the world southern ways of being in, um, in uh, you know, of existing. So, and we were using this kind of term of possession, uh, dispossession. South as a state of mind is not necessarily an art magazine. But and it's a struggle always, but involves the art somehow, and um, it's great that it's coming out from Greece. You know, um, we we try a lot, and every time to um, find fundings, every issue is a new um, kind of situation on how we are in living in uncertainty. It was a good break within Documenta 14 that it became, um, let's say, the official magazine of Documenta 14. So our life was suspended. And now we are back to uh, independent situation as well, doing four issues, starting from the maintenance issue. I think it, um, it somehow, I'm not sure if it make it a big change in um, in uh, Athens or it made something uh, it made Athens to become more internationally known because I believe in this what I call interlocality, which is from locality to locality. But as a repetition, as a mantra, it keeps reminding that there might be unexpected dialogues, there might be um, oral histories, there might be uh, situations from in a village to another village to another village, as opposed to the world of capital, that connect each other. And I have to say, being part in that conversation program that uh, Julieta Aranda uh, uh, put together, I keep having this feeling intensify all the time. I was in this sonic um, lecture the other day. I'm not going to pronounce the word uh, right, but it was this word, kelekeltla or something like that. In Zulu, that means oral history and uh, this kind of uh, very uh, active participation that rhymes or is the equivalent with the world that I could never explain in English. Uh, it's called methexis in Greece. Having a long discussion with the people that they were talking, we totally understood what means keleketle and methexis between each other. So sometimes you're thinking, what if I bypass the support center the language of English, let's say, in that case. And then we somehow find ways to move the world forward altogether. You know, there are also that possibilities. So I think in that way, that's the role of South, uh, even coming out from Greece. And Angelo, you uh, are an artist, and you have work at the Breeder Booth um, here. But you also now are uh, the founder of a project space, Pet Project. Why did you do that to yourself? I mean, you're so busy already. <laughs> what was the urge behind it, and what is it that you do? Well, it's very, very, you know, it's not... Uh, I found this space. I was looking for a studio last year in Athens to work on my quilts, and I wanted a space with no interruptions, no even Wi-Fi. So I found this very, very quiet space, but it was very big. I, I bought it in a ridiculous price. And uh, at some point it was very big, and I said, oh, you know, I'm gonna keep one part of the space to do my stuff, and then the other thing 
it's what I'm, I was always doing also with my artist residencies in these faraway places I did, like the Eternal Internet Brotherhood. So I would have a permanent space. I founded Pet Projects, which in English means like your favorite project, your fun project also. And, uh, you know, I'm going to invite like other artists. Also, I'm going to, I want to have like also a public program with discussions, with situations. And it happened because of the current uh, situation in Athens, which in another place, I think it would never happen. So I have a second show now in uh, two weeks and we will see how it goes. Who is the show by? The show is by a Danish artist called Hannibal Anderson. And we started the first show with a beautiful uh, lecture that Marina made at the space. We had a mysterious uh, painting and we had a performance. Uh, I want to create some sort of a new idea of uh, curating, but as a, on the perspective of the artist, not I'm not a curator myself. So it's a, gonna be a very, very experimental, hopefully, program. And uh, do you wanna say something about what's the future for you? Maybe both in terms of your own personal, professional projects and in terms of what Athens needs or where Athens may be going in the future. The future is bright in Athens. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, basically for us, uh, we're developing as a gallery and we're trying, as I told you before, to break away from the traditional gallery model. So we're finding ways to infiltrate the, 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 the artistic community in many different ways and from different roles. Uh, so not, not necessarily as a gallery per se, but from other ways. Uh, and working closely with all, with all, uh, for, with everybody from the, from the creative community. Yeah. It's hard to speculate on the future because everybody speculates on Greece right now. And uh, somehow I would like to think that um, for me, for us, the future will be how can you uh, build a new reality on flaws. How can you somehow, um, that will be a kind of an interesting future to me, how can you start redefining life from a scar? So I think uh, digging into the present right now, we are, um, I'm thinking on ways how to sustain the magazine always coming out of uh, Greece, so finding ways of a more sustainable funding. At, at the same time, um, I'm looking, I'm working on a research exhibitionary, let's say, program uh, that might unite a lot of independent spaces, which are very, there are a lot of them now in Athens, under one, um, thematic platform, let's say, um, because I feel that what we propose through Documenta 14, what Adam and the team propose, like this kind of collaboration between institutions from Greece and not from Greece, is happening right now. Instead of the state institutions taking on that score, it's the independent spaces that took on this score. And we have a lot of independent spaces that they are between Greek and non-Greek people. And I think that's a wonderful thing to work on. So that's, I'm exploring on a bigger project that will comprise this. Um, I don't know. I think Athens doesn't need so much after all. It's very, 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 very you know, powerful place. And... Uh, you know, we, we will see. It's very, very fluid future, uncertain, and we will see. You guys kind of made me want to move back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Under, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any questions uh, from the audience? Hello, uh, my name is Detlef Schmidt. Uh, I'm the managing director of Viable Design, and um, I'm following this discussion quite intensely, not only here, but also like locally in Greece. And what comes to my mind is like, is this afford really enough or does this involve to make Athens like really great again in terms of culture and in art? Um, an effort like that is being like strongly supported by the government of Greece 
to preserve Greece, the heritage of Greece and culture in general. So what and I, so far, I don't see that happening. I have some questions to you. When was Athens again great? Because you said Athens great again. So just to let you know, I mean, we can discuss that later. Athens and greatness, or what is greatness? Do you mean during the Ottoman Empire? Because Athens is a very new state, if we're talking about the city. If you mean, if you mean the ancient times, um, as I would go again, the greatness of Athens is a kind of a fantasy of the Enlightenment. Athens was great. There were many philosophers and stuff. But of course, we have to remember also that it's a reading by the Enlightenment. Now, um, you were asking, I think, of uh, funding coming from a state. But we are, a, no, a what support? Not only funding, but more like a coordinative support to basically manage all stakeholders in Involved, like in the current discussion. So when I'm in Greece and I'm there quite regularly, I see like lots of like really nice uh, initiatives. Like, but I don't see like um, an institution or maybe the the state government basically to coordinate and maybe like steer the bigger picture. Because like here, Art Basel, it's like art has the basis in, in ancient times. And I think to go to the next level, I think a coordinated approach might be like really helpful. But here is a monetary institution. It's like a bank here. We are in a ins visual institution, which is also a money machine bank. So I don't understand exactly, maybe my colleagues want to answer, what do you mean a kind of a coordinator? But I would love to hear why you are in Athens too, after somebody else. I mean, I would maybe just also add, because we've also been discussing, you know, of course there are certain, there are efforts being made, but it is not easy for a lot of different reasons. And that there can also be something quite, uh, you know, strong about not having, uh, a co I mean, a coordinated effort. Like, what does it mean? Who decides what is right? And I feel that that's exactly why Athens is so interesting, is because there are all of these artists living there and, you know, project spaces. So it's people who create and their own initiatives based on their desires and what they wish to do. So this is a coordinated effort from, which doesn't necessarily follow the same sort of you know, overarching goal imposed from somewhere. And let's not forget that we all carry a little bit of our cultural DNA is from Athens, from that very old, old time, but we still carry it. Hi, thank you for the conversation. It's been really interesting. Um, uh, George, you spoke about um, residency and, and foreign people, artists coming over and living in Kukaiki and everywhere. What mechanism, though, does the country have to then export these um, pieces of work, their ideas, their culture abroad? That's because I don't want them to get lost when they come to Greece, and then that will detract them from actually coming and moving into the country. But when you come to Greece or when you come to Athens as an artist, um, there is no plan, there is no map, you should navigate, you should try and navigate the city yourself, and I think that's part of the charm of the city. It's a very welcoming city, so you will find your way. Um, now in terms of, you talked about exporting art, um, we're trying our best as a gallery to do that. Uh, very actively, we're promoting emerging Greek artists abroad, uh, even here in our Basel, if you come to our booth. Um, it's individual efforts. It's not a coordinated effort yet. Um, but it's something that's building up. I think in one way also, you know, the residency programs for artists and curators, for international people who come for a certain period, um, make a huge difference. And there are new residencies now, Onassis, Air, uh, Arc Athens, uh, among the other initiatives that exist. So people who come there, they make friends, they experience the city, they learn, they, you know, contribute, and then they leave possibly, some do not, uh, and, you know, also carry some of the stories with them. 
Just one small uh, addition to this, and it's not only Athens, you know. Let's say we use the word symbolic Athens, but there are, um, we have this uh, chance to have the archipelago as part of, uh, in the proximity of Athens, with a lot of islands where also there are a lot of artistic residences, possibility of living, and so I think um, it's a kind of an interesting... Uh, of course, we don't have the same means to export as we import, because, you know, we are a weaker financial, uh, financially uh, country than others. But also in Greece, there is a kind of a very interesting um, for, a way of doing things, which is the anarchic bloc, let's put it that way, the libertarian, not the violent anarchic, which is based on exchange economy. And I think this is very, when people come and experience Athens as a city, I think they understand that this kind of um, um, faith on exchange is still there. It has not been overcapitalized. Yeah, if you like politics, that's the place to come to. <laughs> <laughs> My question, well, it's sort of first a statement. Um, one of the things I love about Athens, besides Athens itself, is that it isn't being occupied by massive gentrification, luxury condos that you see in New York, Toronto, Berlin, these buildings popping up, luxury, luxury, wealth apartments, and the artists get pushed away, and the neighborhoods get pushed away. And I think from what I know of my many friends who've gone to visit Athens, is they find it very creative the walk within the city and the possibilities and so many. So do you have a fear of massive gentrification in Athens in the future? Can I say, I don't believe that uh, massive uh, gentrification will happen in Greece. The system is um, so adjusted that that will never happen. Uh, for example, like there is this very frivolous uh, phrase that you hear that Athens will become the new Berlin. No way, because, you know, Athens, it's still, we have to be pragmatic. A city, the capital of a small country with very, very big problems, financial, mostly, not so social, and social, of course. And uh, so it will never lose uh, its uh, own identity. There might be some parts that you see, like Kukaki, who are being really gentrified, but these are very, very small places. It's a big city. Uh, the, the fabric of politics is very much, you know, working, operating in a very special way. We had also this discussion sometimes. We are very much stuck to the Byzantine times. We were discussing before. so. That will never happen, and I'm very, very happy about it. Actually, I, 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 yes, Byzantine times. I, I hope that we are not stuck there because people no, killed each I other mean. there. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think that there is a very... Speaking of absence, as a gentleman was saying before, of coordinating um, um, a sort of program to support uh, the efforts, actually there are some very great other systems that um, doesn't allow this gentrification. There is a law in Greece, for example, that has to do with the height. So the buildings stay low. When we say gentrified Kukaki, we mean uh, houses that they were like abandoned in of the 30s being now renewed again. So when we speak of gentrification, is somebody somewhere, somewhere there thought of this kind of situations, how not to allow the city to become like that, and maybe didn't call himself like or herself a great coordinator of the city. But we have to understand that we are talking about a country that right now, although there is free health system and all that, there is no, um, let's say, uh, material in the hospitals. The fair, there is no alcohol. You have to bring your own uh, plasters. So you understand. I mean, we are still in Europe, but is what I call in a very, uh, not in a derogative way, we are a third world in Europe. And we are counting actually in your help not to get gentrified. Yes. Really. If the right people come there and they give a chance to this world not to over-gentrify every location that is out there, then we are done. Would you come? <laughs> Hi. Um, Michael Herbert-Durn. Uh, I'm an artist. 
In terms of uh, diversity and a range of visual culture, what's happening in, in Athens? Mostly what I've seen is support for uh, Greek, Greek artists. Uh, is there a push to r really spread a broad range of visual culture and ideas in Athens uh, from other artists coming there? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's... There are institutions like the Onassis Foundation that supports artists from all over. It doesn't matter if you're Greek or not. There are residencies. Uh, there are things happening on the islands. So it's a matter of really exploring those possibilities. Yes. Um, a lot of artists come to Athens because they get away from the rat race of a, main, a major art capital, and they come there in order to better their own work, in order to create, you know, um, uh, works, and then, it's, you know, it's easy to travel, it's easy to keep your connections, and as you would do in every other city. It's just a matter of what the city offers you that you take advantage of. I have to say that for a long time, unfortunately, um, the help from, I mean, the help from the state, as we're saying, specifically towards the Greek artists was absent on any kind of a structural, uh, structural manner, apart from the galleries or, and also, unfortunately, let's say, because there is a, um, a clan of mega collectors in Greece, they weren't necessarily investing on um, artists from Greece. Uh, now they're starting, which is actually quite better. I mean, I'm not sure buying or investing, but somehow they support through other ways uh, an organization now. It's not that it was totally absent, but we have to understand, like, if we compare with other locations, you had, um, you know, all these collectors being the presidents, the vice presidents, the primary funders of institutions like uh, very well done. The uh, Guggenheim, while artists back home were starving and didn't have even the state's uh, infrastructure to uh, get exported. So if somebody s suffer from this more is the Greek artists, I think. Now, all the artists that they are coming in Greece right now, because there is a big movement, specifically after the Documenta as well, but based to all this, because Documenta came for some reasons too, is they're learning from Athens how to navigate in this kind of darker or let's not call it, let's not put the color this kind of um, uh, more sober and more complicated environment so there is a way of learning the benefit of most of the people specifically artists coming in greece uh, is that they have their own funding we have a lot of artists, for example, from Nordic countries uh, moving in Greece. Um, and uh, they, they carry their own funding from their countries. But, so they don't have to suffer for anything. But what I have to say and what I'm so glad to but see... you have to suffer a little bit. Yeah, but what I have to say is that they found alternative ways of exchanging what the world economy dictates to do coming as a Norwegian artist, on quote marks, or with your budget, and opening up an uh, independent space with, uh, together in collaboration with a Greek artist that offers you the knowledge while you offer the money, it's a way to spread the world, a micro way, that can be paradigmatic for the rest of the, for the, <laughs> the big governments, let's say. I should say something, I had really, really, be I, I, I kind of like express the very, very positive uh, Athenian uh, aspect. Personally, I had a lot of, lot of, uh, you know, problems also in, uh, you know, as the state. In the, it's not really one side of the problem. I would say I tried to renew my my subscription at the artist union just after my participation in Documenta, and they just denied me. So you also have also this kind of really, really dramatic also situations, and uh, you know. It's not an easy place. Nobody should think that Athens is an easy place. So, but it's a very interesting uh, situation. And it's a, a city, you know, uh, a model probably of, I don't know, self-sustainable situation, freedom, egalitarian, yeah. 
I mean, regarding the funding, also, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a shame that funding still depends on nationality, whether you're Norwegian or Greek. So it would be interesting to think about funding models that go beyond that, in my opinion. In Europe. In, <laughs> in Europe, yeah. So um, I think we need to end here. Um, I hope you all come to visit and move <laughs> to Athens. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julieta.